in Vidivo, we've been looking forward to the new year and some of the new formats that we're doing and beginning to expand into. As we take it on the road, so to speak, we're going to use some remote settings and go out and possibly go by the lake, you know, and go by the river and get an opportunity to share some of those things that we've been wanting to do ever since we first started Vidivo. But we haven't had always the chance to do that, especially with circumstances being such as you've just gone through, and I'm sure that so have I, in the challenges that the economy is presenting. Now, we all rejoice in that which God has given us, because we know He will provide for us always in every circumstance and situation of our life, because those circumstances are always meant to turn us to Him. Because once we have turned like rivers in the south to the sea, then we find that God, being our sustenance, is always there. He's never left us nor forsaken us, though we may have forsaken Him at times when we were prosperous or when we thought we had everything we needed. And we turned away from the Lord and we chose to go our own way in our finances or in our circumstances, thinking that we could do it. And then suddenly we discovered that this house that we built this idea that we had, this little kingdom that we made, had become like a house of cards that unfortunately fell apart. Or like a house that's built upon sand that once the foundation has been built, then you no longer are able to move it. And once you have placed your house upon sand, then when the storms come, you realize that it's not the best location for your house to be. And that's what Jesus wanted to remind us of that we should do well to consider the foundation of our life. Where are we coming from and where are we going? I know a lot of people, especially this time of year, they like to think about the New Year's. They like to think about what's going to happen and get excited about a party or a celebration of that which is going to come about. And yet, there is also a time of sorrow and sadness that people sing songs like Old Lang Syne and they think about the past and they take the moment to reflect on that which they've been through, on those things that have changed from where they were a year ago to where they are today. I would encourage you to maybe take the time to sit down and think about that. Think about where you were a year ago, what dreams you had, what visions you thought, what things you said you were going to do. Because it's not so bad to have resolutions or to have ideas, you know, that you thought and you committed. But it is a good idea to take stock of where you're at and where you're going. Because you see, we all reap what we sow. And sometimes the field that we're in still is going to produce a harvest that maybe we haven't gone into that field and weeded out all the weeds that are just waiting for the winter to pass and the spring to happen. Because, you see, whenever spring comes and there's a big time of growing, then it's like the wheat grows up with the tares. It's like there's there's this great enjoyment and excitement over what new things have come and this new time of ecstatic feelings about, oh, look, spring is here, and everybody gets thrilled over the idea of, oh, now we're prosperous. And then, just like the children of Israel were warned that when you go into the land and you have become prosperous, then don't forsake the Lord your God. In the year that's coming, I'd love to say that you know, I look forward to what's going to happen, but I don't. I'd love to say that I think that all things are going to be so much better for you than that. They're going to be, oh, just an exciting time of serving the Lord and doing that which God wants you to do, but frankly, I don't think so. I think 2012 is going to become a year that a lot of people will look at political, social, and economic means as more important than their religious life. Because you see, we all have a religion, whether we admit it or not. We do things with our faith that if it's involving God, then it's relationship. But if it's just without God, and it's just about God, then it's religion. And so. The things we do with him, of course, are a relationship with him, because we're a born-again Christian, so you have a relationship with God, whether you 
participate in it or not, God is still working on that. But your religion demonstrates where you're coming from and where you're going to. It's kind of like a road map and a distinctive direction that you're heading. Now Jesus said straight is the way and narrow is the path that leads to salvation, but broad is the way and wide is the gate that leads to destruction. 2012 will be a time to prepare for the coming of the Lord. Now, I can't tell you that you're going to live through 2012 any more than I can tell you that I will. Because every one of us has a destiny. We have a time to live, a time to die, a time to be born, a time to cherish, a time to rejoice, a time of sorrow, a time of sadness, a time of prosperity. But there's also sometimes time of disease, a time of sickness, a time of ill health. So I have no idea what the Lord may take you through in 2012. I only know this about you and about me. We will live through it. We may die in our physical body, but our spirit will survive. Because our spirit will go back to that place where God began with us, which is he breathed life into us and we became a living being. He is the third part of creation. Whenever two people get together and procreate, they don't procreate, they participate in creation. The third part is God. God breathes life into that cellular manifestation of two recumbent DNAs and RNAs that become together one living cell that begins to subdivide. And that happens by way of God doing it. <laughs> because without God, it couldn't happen. Because in Him we live and move and have our being. So without Him being in it, it wouldn't happen. Much to the dismay of science, I'm sure. But the reality of who you are is that being an eternal being, your years here will seem like dust in the wind when compared to eternity in heaven. When compared to stepping out of this body and moving into the reality of the eternal life that you were promised to live, whether in heaven or in hell, then you'll begin to know that time is not that important. Time is relative to what you are living today. This moment is the most important day of your life. This is the day that the Lord has made and we can rejoice and be glad in it if we are choosing to walk with him and to talk with him today. Because every day is a new day. Every day we sleep and God watches over us. Every day that we're awake, God is with us. And we choose to make that day with God or without him. So religiously, I pray that as the new year begins to manifest itself for you, as you begin to look forward to where you're going to go after January and February and March, looking forward probably to summer, if you're like most people and you get more wrapped up into doing things in the summer than you do in the winter, I hope that you look soberly at the doomsday things that are out there that people are going to want to try to get you involved in. The end of the economic forecast, oh no, the oh no, the political activists that have to say, oh no, God forbid that somebody should get elected and somebody else should or shouldn't. And It'll be the end of the world if they do get elected. Oh, no. Or even social occasions where we have this huge manifestation of people getting frustrated at the economic system and they want to change it and occupy. You know, you're passing through. You're just going through this life. And you're going to exist beyond it. Plan accordingly. Don't get wrapped up, caught up, and stumbled by 2012. Don't get deceived by those things that want to conceive in you fear and create anger and hostility. Because there is a peace that passes all understanding. There is a joy that we have in God that though we look at, even like Jesus sat above Jerusalem and looked down and wept, there is a time to look around and see that things may not get real good though they may be better in some ways. Spiritually, I hate to say it, but I think we've gone to a place where people are separating themselves rather than coming together in love. Choose 
you this day whom you will serve. That if the Lord your God is God, and if he is real and alive in your life, then ask him what you would do for the new year. But also ask him to show you what happened in the last year that maybe you could improve upon or change and rearrange in a direction that you want to go for the new year. Because God is always about developing us. He's not an urban renewal project. He's not a, we're going to save your flesh. No, he's going to tell you that flat out, you are going to die. You are going to be crucified, just like Christ was. But though I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the will of the Son of God, who died for me and gave himself for me. So the reality of having Jesus in us is the life that you live for him and with him as you move forward in the new year. Today, as you walk with God, as you talk with him, as you are experiencing him, when you think of those whom you read who are in anguish, do you ever think of how my heart as being the father of God, being the father, must ache with woe of it for the anguish that I feel for my children who do not know me? If I beheld the city and wept over it, how much more should I weep over the agony of those troubled hearts over lives that seek to live without my sustaining power? They will not come unto me that they might have life. Live to bring others to me, the only source of happiness, the only true peace. In this new year, as I look at it, I see people being distracted not because they're attracted by the world, but because they are concerned about the world. But the world has a destiny that manifests itself in the sinfulness of man himself. And that reality is going to become more obvious as the world chooses the way it will go. God will grow up his children to prepare them for his return. Now, as I said, it isn't going to happen in 2012. There won't be any pre-trib rapture. There won't be this kind of ooh and ah, you know, about, oh, wow, look, we're going to have, you know, some trumpet or something from Revelation occur. But rather, the letters to the seven churches, you might want to read them and consider well where you fit into these circumstances that we now live in. Because as you read the letters to the seven churches, as you discover what it is that you are hearing from God, then you'll know the truth because God is the one who speaks to you. God is teaching you. He's giving you his Holy Spirit that you can learn from him and you can discern the way that you should go. So if I could encourage you before the New Year's, even as we're running down the time limit before the ball drops or the time changes or as in the Gentile calendar we say, you know, it's Happy New Year. Look at those letters. Read each one carefully. Consider if there are seven of them. Which one you really fit into? Which one describes where you're at today? Because that doesn't mean that you're stuck there. It means you're in a process of development. It means that you're changing and rearranging your life circumstances in order to coordinate the decisions you've made and the consequences of your choices to fall into place with what God intended for you. Because any of us can look back at our past and we can say, Oh, woe is me, you know, I'm a man undone because of all the things that I have done. And that harvest may have come into your life and you may have suffered the consequences of your choices. I know that's what happened to America in the reality of this financial burden that they're in. But what you can do is not be a part of it, but find the mercy of God in the reality of reading his word daily walking with him prayerfully, knowing him in a more intimate way than you've ever chosen to know him before, because 2012 is kind of like the bell ringing. It's a wake up time. After 2012, most of us that study prophecy, that understand the scriptures that deal with Jesus on a one-on-one, we look at any time after 2012, could be gone. But so whatever the Lord chooses to do, that you should do, and what he tells you to do, that you should follow. And so, for a lot of us that believe in pre-trib, there's a lot of people we believe that will be gone, you know, and maybe some of them won't. 
Read the letters to the seven churches, and that will kind of give you a good idea of who will remain and who will not. It's serious and sober time we live in. We are in the last generation. We are in the last days. No, I'm not telling you 2012 you'll be raptured or that you're going to live through it. You might, you know. <laughs> the odds are, you know, you never know. With 7 billion people in the world, who knows? But even if you do live through it, as we pray you do, and even as you enjoy God in it, I pray that you continue to walk in His mercy, in His grace, and in His love as He leads you and as He guides you in the way that you should go. Because anyone can tell you what to do. Anyone can tell you how to do it. But not too many people will give you the tools, the opportunity, and the prayers to just simply say, Ask God. Walk with Him. Talk with Him. Know Him. And let Him lead you. And then be with people that you enjoy and celebrate the life God has given you. But also recognize that there are people perishing. And you might want to tell them about what you've discovered. The little bit you know you can't share with someone else. To tell them that yes, Jesus is coming. Yes, there is a hell. Yes, there is a heaven. Of course, the good news is you're going there. The bad news is questioning how you get there. <laughs> okay, God might want to do something there. You know? So you may want to kind of have it out with God and figure out where it is, what it is he's going to do to get you there. So my prayer today is that you would consider yourself a lot for where you've been to where you're going. But also in some way, sing a prayer, please. I have in-laws and my wife's children who most of them are not saved they do not know jesus in a personal way they have no desire no care no interest whatsoever of anything to do with god religion or personal faith they are a product of their generation their hearts have been hardened their ears deafened so I would ask you to not just pray for my family because you know it's it's nice that you know my wife and I got married you know in, in the latter years and our children are already grown and my whole family is saved you know my sisters and you know so I got some nieces and nephews I'm not too sure about but you know if I trying to go see them you know go talk to them I don't know that they can save but who knows you never know but we all know that we have an individual choice, and I would ask you to be mindful of your children, your family, your immediate circle of friends that somehow, in some way, at least pray for them, because that is the greatest thing you could do. The greatest thing in secret. Pray for them. Pray for their salvation. Don't pray anything major, whatever, of anything else, but just pray that one thing in 2012. Make a list of all those you want saved. And then just pray it. Don't tell anyone. Don't tell me. Just pray for them. And you know what? Maybe I'll do the same. 